Good morning and welcome to today's Wilson Center Africa program event and webcast on refugee women's inclusion in peace agreements and peace building in Africa, challenges and opportunities. My name is Katherine Helmers and I am the program assistant for the Wilson Center Africa program. For those who are unfamiliar with the Wilson Center, it was chartered by Congress in 1968 as a living memorial to President Woodrow Wilson. The Wilson Center is the nation's key nonpartisan policy forum for tackling global issues through independent research and open dialogue to inform actionable ideas for the policy community. The University of Pennsylvania's Global Go-To Think Tank Index Report recently ranked the Wilson Center as one of the top 10 think tanks globally. The Wilson Center Africa program works to address the most critical issues facing US and US-Africa relations, build mutually beneficial US-Africa relations, and enhance knowledge and understanding about Africa in the United States. Today's event is held under the banner of the Southern Voices Network for Peacebuilding. Established with the support of the Carnegie Corporation of New York, the Southern Voices Network for Peacebuilding is a continent-wide network of 22 African policy, research, and academic organizations that work with the Wilson Center's Africa program to bring African knowledge and perspectives to US, African, and international policy on peacebuilding in Africa. One of the main components of the SVNP network is the Research Scholarship Program. Scholars from member organizations are hosted by the Africa program here in Washington, DC for a three-month resident scholar program where they complete a policy-oriented research project and engage with US policymakers and practi pra practitioners. The scholars share their research findings with these policymakers and practi practitioners <laughs> while simultaneously bringing local context and knowledge into US policy discussions. Today, SVNP scholar Ms. Sandra Tumwesi-J will share the results of her research project with us. For those following us online, we are live tweeting today's event and taking questions on Twitter and via our website. To join the discussion, please tweet your questions and tag us at Africa Up Close with the hashtag Women Building Peace, or use the chat function below the live stream video on our website. I would now like to introduce Dr. Chantal de Young Udrat, Wilson Center Fellow and member of the Board of Directors of, of Women in International Security, who will set the stage for today's discussion and introduce our speakers. Dr. de Young Udrat's full bio can be found on the event webpage. Thank you very much, uh, Catherine, and I have to say that I'm delighted to be here. I think this. Uh, research scholar program is really a fantastic program and so anything I can do to help and promote this program I gladly do. Uh, now before I introduce our speakers uh, let me say a few words about uh, about this panel. Uh, as you all know in 2000 members of the UN Security Council adopted UN Security Council resolution 1325 which really launched the Women, Peace, and Security Agenda, or as we call in short, the WPS Agenda. Now, a central element of the WPS Agenda is the recognition of the importance of women's participation and representation in peace and security decision-making processes. In addition, the council members uh, recognize the importance of integrating a gender perspective when considering peace and security issues. That is to say that they recognize that the impacts and the experiences of war and armed conflict are different depending on one's gender. The experiences and impacts are different for men and women and for other gender people. For example, men are more likely to die in combat women are more likely to be subjected to sexual violence. Everybody loses in war, but people do so in different ways, and much of this is related to one's gender identity. Now, refugees and internally displaced persons have particular vulnerabilities, including vulnerabilities related to their host countries. They also have different needs. Refugee women in particular are uh, at risk for sexual violence. Unfortunately, refugee women and their concerns are often 
overlooked when it comes to conflict resolution and peace building efforts. Now we have a terrific panel today that will examine the vulnerabilities and needs of refugee women, the obstacles they face to get heard, and what can be done to make sure that they are included in conflict resolution policy processes. So let me introduce our panel. Next to me is Megan Carrado. Megan is the Director for Policy and Advocacy at the Alliance for Peacebuilding, an international network of peacebuilding organizations and individuals. She's also the co-chair of the US Civil Society Working Group on WPS, a group that has been in existence for now 12 years and brings together some 60 US NGOs with the purpose of monitoring uh, US implementation of the WPS agenda and providing the US government with advice on these issues. Uh, prior to her current post, she was Director of Advocacy of Women for Afghan Women. Uh, Megan has really uh, deep expertise and knowledge of the NGO community, civil society, but also of government. She has also served in the Office for the Secretary of Defense and at the US House of Representatives. She is a lawyer by training, uh, and um, your knowledge about the WPS agenda is just phenomenal. So we're very happy to have you here. Second, we turn to our scholar of the Southern Voices Network for Peacebuilding, Sandra Tumwe CJ. I hope I said that right. You did. She is the Advocacy and Partnership Manager at the Women's International Peace Center, a feminist uh, peacebuilding organization with a mission to support women's leadership, amplify women's voices, and deepen their activism in creating peace. Sandra's research, her advocacy, and her programming is focused on promoting women's leadership in conflict and conflict settings. She has a Master's of Arts in Peace Education from the University of Peace in Costa Rica. Yes. A Master's Degree in Cooperation and Development from the Institute for Advanced Studies of Pavia in Italy. Yes. And a Bachelor of Mass Communication from Makera University in Uganda. Um, and then our final, but certainly not last, speaker is Vernell Trim Fitzpatrick. Vernell is a career civil servant at the U.S. State Department and the director of the Office of Assistance to Africa in the Bureau of Population, Refugees, and Migration. Now, uh, throughout her 23-year career, I think, in the State Department, she has worked in Africa, Europe, and Latin America. And prior to her current position, she served as the Deputy Chief of Mission at the U.S. Embassy in Cameroon. In Washington, she has also served as the Deputy Director in the Bureau of African Affairs. Uh, she has extensive knowledge uh, of the issues that we're discussing today. And um, I thank you very much for joining us because you can really uh, provide us with that policy perspective and, and um, you know, give us a reality check of what we as scholars and activists are saying is actually uh, feasible. So, uh, as Catherine said, the full bios of our panelists can be found on the event web page. Um, the way this panel is going to work, I will give the microphone to each of our panelists for some initial eight minute introductory remarks. And after that, we will turn to the audience for Q&A. Um, those who are in the audience here, you can raise your hand and I will recognize you. And the others who are in the virtual room, uh, you can uh, tweet your comments and questions at Africa up close, or you can also use the chat function. So let us get started. Megan, uh, let's start with you, and why don't you set the stage for us in terms of the challenges that refugee f women face in having their voices heard and participating in these policy discussions. Great. Thank you, Chantal, so much. It's so wonderful to be here with you. I've missed you over the last two and a half years. 
Um, and just a quick note, Chantel helped create the U.S. Civil Society Working Group on WPS and has been an integral leader uh, for our community. And so it's, it's an honor to sit with you as always. Um, and thank you so much to the Wilson Center for having us. It's lovely to be back in person. Uh, I'm seeing people in the audience. I'm wearing high heels. That's less exciting, but really, really good to be with you all. Uh, so I just want to start with a, a few successes. Over the last 20 years since uh, UN Security Council Resolution 1325 was passed, we've seen another, a number of follow-on resolutions that have strengthened the initial principles in that resolution. We've seen annual debates at the UN. We've seen uh, WPS integrated into peacekeeping missions. We now have feminist foreign policies scattered around the world where they ensure WPS and gender equity are key cornerstones of their international relations. And in the United States, we have the WPS Act, the strategy and implementation plans, but that's not enough. We haven't gotten as far as we need to, and why? Too often, peace processes are only involve the parties to the conflict and omits the people that are most impacted. And we know that women are disproportionately impacted by, by war. Refugee women in particular have a unique perspective in this. And we need to ensure that women are included because as Chantal alluded to, Everyone experiences conflict differently. Women experience it certainly differently. And refugee women maybe have the worst lot in it. They have been ripped from their homes. They have faced the horrors of war and the attendant risks and losses that come with being a refugee. Too often, they are subjected to sexual and gender-based violence and a loss of economic and educational opportunities. And it's a personal loss. They lose husbands and fathers and brothers and sons. They have to become the sole caretaker, the breadwinner, the rocks of their family, and their voices. They perhaps have the biggest incentive to be participating in peace building and peace processes. They've often been subject to atrocities and human rights abuses, and it's critical to ensure their voices are involved so that they can make sure that uh, traditional justice and accountability mechanisms are included in agreements. But the bottom line is, we can't have peace when we only consult half the population. And we can't have peace when we, we don't consult those most impacted. We know those are women, and refugee women are integral to moving forward. In terms of some of the challenges this inclusion entails, there are several, practically. It's very difficult to travel often to border countries or um, refugee populations that may be scattered across numerous countries. A lot of this boils down to financial constraints. And then there's political challenges. There's often a lack of will by the backers of peace processes. They are, again, really focused on the track one process where it's the parties to the conflict. And to the extent civil society is consulted, it's often very capital-centric and elite-centric, which is problematic because it does not take into account the very diverse uh, populations. And then there are process challenges how to figure out how to include a broad, broad cross-section of refugee women, again, that may be scattered across numerous contexts. And lastly, there are personal challenges. How do you get buy-in from women who are just struggling to survive every single day, to have enough food, to have enough water, to have access to medicine, and to keep their families safe? So what lessons can we have, have we gleaned over the last 20 years or so? As we know, refugees have been largely marginalized in peace processes. I know my colleague's going to speak a bit more on, on the ways in which South Sudanese, South Sudanese women have been engaged in Uganda, which is a bright spot um, in terms of experiences in the past. There are some general key lessons that we've gleaned from, from WPS over the last 20 years. We need wide-ranging and inclusive consultation. Donors must invest in track two as much as they invest in track one processes and scale up opportunities for track one and a half. To the extent women are involved, stop tokenizing them. It's not enough just to have one woman at the table. Too often they are cherry picked from political elites, as I mentioned, capital centric folks. We need to ensure a broad cross section of women's involvement. It can't be a box ticking exercise. We must include women in all of their diversity. We also must ensure that they are included in the design, consultation, formal and informal processes, and specifically the monitoring and oversight of peace processes. A couple contexts come to mind uh, of successes. Northern Ireland women crossed religious divides and elbowed their way into that process and became honest brokers. They were critical in doing shuttle diplomacy to move that process along, a model to, to be looked at. Colombia in 2016, it was really one of the first times we've seen any elements of the WPS formal agenda included in that process, although the many challenges abound. And then we have Afghanistan most recently. 
many would call that an abject failure. I'm happy to discuss that a little bit more detail during the discussion. So what do we do? What are the policy recommendations we can advance to include women more broadly and refugee women specifically? Funding, 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 funding. We spend a treasure trove on the art of war, but not on the art of peace. We spend even less to make sure that peace processes are inclusive and sustainable. We must invest in upstream prevention and peace building to address the conflict dynamics that give rise to, to conflict and displacement more broadly. We also must address, uh, invest in inclusive peace processes. Again, cannot be a box ticking exercise. Women are not a monolith. They must be represented in all of their diversity. As climate and conflict compound each other, we know that the refugee population around the world is going to spike. We need to create an infrastructure to address these challenges now and ensure that refugee women have the opportunities to meaningfully participate. Second, we must break down silos. Too often, WPS sits over here in its own little box and is not integrated across its foreign assistance and policy. It's time for a feminist foreign policy everywhere, in states and in, in multilateral institutions. So far with the men in charge, it hasn't really worked out. We're still having a lot of conflict. We're still having more, bigger challenges than we've ever faced before. It's time to fund and operationalize the WPS agenda. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. As I mentioned, we have the WPS Act, strategy plans, we have models around the world that we can utilize. But now is the time for implementation and refugee women must be an integral part of that process. Thank you. Thank you very much, Megan, and uh, you sure put down some uh, provocative statements. In particular, I think we'll come back to Afghanistan. Uh, but let me, for, uh, let me turn now to Sandra. Uh, Sandra, tell us a little bit about your research, in particular your research on South Sudanese women in Uganda. Okay, so I was asked to share my assessment of the importance of gender-inclusive peace building um, and specifically refugee women's inclusion in implementing peace agreements to share some lessons learned from the research and also a few recommendations. Um, so I start by echoing what you've already said about um, women's participation and influence in peace processes being globally acknowledged as central to durable peace um, and highlighting the fact that conflict affected women are often excluded. Um, and this includes specifically those who face uh, multiple and intersecting forms of discrimination, including displaced women, for instance, refugee women who may also be young, um, have disabilities, or live in rural areas such as refugee settlements. Um, the value of meaningfully and non-tokenistically including diverse women, among whom are refugee women, is clear um, across all stages of peace processes, including in the implementation of peace agreements. Um, s evidence confirms that when diverse women and their voices are included, uh, it's beneficial for everybody. Uh, peace processes are more likely to address the root cause causes of conflict, to have stronger legitimacy, to have broader ownership, and have um, a higher likelihood for successful peace outcomes. Um, studies have also shown that when women have influence on matters of peace, um, it's, it's more likely to be durable, um, and that their leadership and decision-making during political transitions reduces the chances for civil war. Um, this same acknowledgement of the importance of including diverse women and including their voices is reflected I at national level in the policy frameworks to implement the UN Security Council Resolution 1325 that you've all referred to um, on women, peace, and security. So countries like South Sudan have committed to through their national action plans to amplify women's roles in peace building and to ensure the broad participation of women, including displaced women. In Uganda, which is Africa's top um, refugee hosting country, mm. um, the third national action plan incorporates refugee women and a specific focus on their role in conflict prevention and resolution as a key emerging focus. And we've seen that by creating that enabling environment, refugee women, including young women and women with peace with disabilities in Uganda, have been able to take leadership to work with, um, with government um, leaders and with local women peace builders, um, with great success in conflict early warning, um, conflict prevention and peace building to mitigate conflict and ensure a peaceful coexistence between ethnic groups and you know, between communities, so refugee communities and host, um, host communities. So from the research, a few which focused on you know, the nature and extent to which South Sudanese refugee women in West Nile, um, in Uganda, 
are included in implementing the agreement, the revitalized agreement for the resolution of conflict in South Sudan. Um, we found that it highlighted the need for a more proactive and sustained approach to ensuring refugee women's inclusion in peace building in their countries of origin. Um, a key lessons that can be applied to other contexts include one, um, the importance of consistently providing refugee women within refugee settlements with information on implementation progress you know, of the peace agreements and also on poti potential opportunities for them to influence and participate in, in discussions around um, you know, ongoing processes. We find that putting in place communication channels and peace and feedback mechanisms is key. Two, the need to ensure that support to refugees, inclusion in peacemaking and peace building is not gender blind. Um, and that in a, when a refugee woman is supported to be able to participate in key discussions or to engage with implementation actors, that that support also includes um, efforts for them to broadly consult other refugee women within settlements and also upon their return to provide feedback on the discussions that have been held um, you know, to the other refugee women that they represent. Three, um, the value of networked advocacy between the refugee women and women peace builders and women's rights coal coalitions in their countries, the countries of origin as a way to facilitate um, a more sustained inclusion of refugee women's voices and their priorities and perspectives in ongoing discussions and interventions around you know, implementing the peace agreement. And lastly, the importance of policymakers and practitioners addressing um, practical and conceptual barriers that limit refugee women's participation, um, including negative social norms and mindsets um, within the communities, but also within public institutions about their capacities and their roles um, particularly in the case for young women who face additional challenges and also in the case of women with disabilities who face barriers in <coughs> physically accessing <coughs> meetings or being able to consume you know, information without specific accommodations being made for them. So my top three recommendations for improving um, refugee women's inclusion in the implementation of peace agreements will focus more on the case of my research but can be applied to other contexts. They focus on the the government in the countries of origin and the sig signatories to the peace agreements, to the host countries and the development partners that are, are serving them where they are, and also to supporters of you know, long-term peace um, in their countries and also to the, the peace process that they are trying to participate in and influence. So in the case of South Sudanese refugee women in Uganda, the first one would be for the government of South Sudan and parties to the revitalized peace agreement to recognize the capacities of South Sudanese women living in refugee settlements in Uganda by working with the government of Uganda and international partners to establish and operationalize practical measures to sustain, for their sustained inclusion, the sustained inclusion of women, refugee women in decision making around the peace agreements implementation and the future of South Sudan. Second would be for the government of Uganda, so for any host country and for the development partners that are um, serving refugees and refugee women to put in place mechanisms within refugee settlements to provide current information, to consult, to receive input and provide a, a feedback loop on um, peace agreement implementation pro progress to a larger number of diverse refugee women. Um, and to make sure that these platforms for example, community meetings that they consider and address the barriers that women with disabilities and youth face. And that in the, in the event that there are online meetings that they also facilitate the access um, of these refugee women and that they equip them with the skills and the tools to be able to participate you know, in a, the digital world while also tackling the risks, security risks associated with that. Um, and lastly, to support us of you know, long-term peace in these countries and to the peace processes in the case of South Sudan, that would be, um, for example, the US government, the UK, Norway government, and you know, other supporters of the revitalized peace agreement um, to prioritize the specific case of refugee women within settlements um, in efforts to encourage um, and support the government of South Sudan and you know, any other governments to ensure women's meaningful participation in peace and security processes, particularly related to the, the revitalized peace agreement in the case of my research. So to allot a portion of the funding for implementing the women peace and security agenda in South Sudan and in Uganda to interventions that facilitate the participation of women in refugee settlements in um, peace agreement implementation.
Thank you very much, Sandra, and I think you have some, uh, some very good recommendations and a very interesting recommendation, in particular, I think, in terms of the network advocacy and uh, really the importance about information. Uh, and I think we'll get back to that, uh, you know, who should be giving that information or who should be organizing that. Uh, Vernel, um, tell us, from a policy perspective, how do you see this, and what do you think, you know, outside governments, donors uh, can do to um, put the spotlight on the plight of refugee women? Great. Well, good morning. And let me begin by thanking Woodrow Wilson Center for organizing this event today. I'm really honored to be on this panel with Chantal and, and Megan and uh, Sandra today. Now, the Bureau of Population, Refugees, and Migration, or PRM, is the State Department's humanitarian arm. We provide life-saving assistance and protection to refugees, asylum seekers, internally displaced persons, and other populations of concern. And whether they may be, be coming from uh, recently, um, recently emerging crises, such as uh, the situation in northern Eth Ethiopia, or if they're in protracted situations and they're, uh, uh, say they're in, say, Algeria or Mauritania, for, that, for example. While we operate in the humanitarian space, one can say, broadly speaking, we're operating in peace building. Mm. When we restore dignity, when we provide safety, when we provide basic items that all human beings need, such as uh, health care, food, sanitation, education, and support for livelihoods, then we build and promote peace. As they try to rebuild their lives, Refugee women in Africa face numerous obstacles in, in uh, participating in decision-making processes. Outside of their home countries, it's very difficult for them to be able to participate in conversations and activities around post-conflict peace building. In their countries of asylum, uh, women also face uh, r uh, significant obstacles for participating in and informing conversations and activities at the local and national levels. Due to cultural norms, women are often relegated to traditional roles such as childcare and housekeeping. Women also tend to have fewer financial resources than men, making it more difficult for them to take on more leadership roles. Those who head households or who are disabled or who have tenuous incomes are particularly vulnerable to physical and sexual violence. And the bottom line is that women, refugee women, uh, they're not heard or listened to as much as they should be. And this is true whether we're speaking of camp management or peace agreements. But women, refugee women, cannot just be seen as uh, victims or beneficiaries. Uh, they are often on the front lines, uh, delivering aid, uh, mediating conflict, supporting communities. Um, but these activities are more likely to be carried out informally. Now, the increased vulnerabilities and challenges that we're seeing that women face really require us to apply a gender lens to foreign policy. And as Megan already mentioned, we have the 2017 passage of the Women, uh, Peace and Security Act. And also we have the 2019 launch of the US government's national strategy on uh, women, peace and security, uh, which provides the, stream, uh, the strategic framework for what the US government is doing to advance the role of women. And PRM's work is captured in that strategy. Our funding to uh, partners, including UNHCR, for example, support a range of programming, such as mental health and psychosocial support and healthcare for survivors of gender-based violence, or GBV. Preventing and responding to gender-based violence is a life-saving priority and an integral part of every humanitarian uh, response. We've done much, but to be honest, uh, there's much more to be done. Uh, prioritizing the needs of women and girls are still not part, um, it's still not part of the DNA of emergency responses. And this is why we are committed to implementing the Safe From The Start initiative, for example. PRM and USAID launched this initiative in 2013 to increase leadership, accountability, and resources available for life-saving GBV prevention and response. The initiative also supports uh, services for survivors um, from the onset of and during the emergencies. For example, our Safe From The Start funding um, allowed our partners to send GBV technical experts to South Sudan and Uganda. 
where they, they set up case management and referral pathways. So what exactly did they do? Well, they advised uh, water and sanitation teams in establishing separate latrines for women and men with locks, and they provided water, point, um, water points in safe places. They persuaded the camp managers to include women in managing food distribution and also um, managing uh, the camps. They advised staffs on looking at how to reduce <coughs> GBV risks, looking at the entirety of their operations and to engage women's participation. And over time, our partners trained several hundred international, national, and local humanitarian staff to recognize and address and refer uh, GBV, ca uh, GBV cases. Another area in which we're very involved in is uh, allowing and helping refugees to become more self-reliant. Um, and again, this is very important. It's a core objective of the Global Compact on Refugees. Uh, with our support, the Refugee Self-Reliance Initiative, a multi-stakeholder collaboration, is undertaking uh, groundbreaking work to identify programming that actually works, that focuses on uh, measuring self-reliance and advocating for policies that enable self-reliance for refugees, including refugee women. It aims to reach 5 million refugees with programming by 2023. Um, the graduation approach is another program that we support. It's basically a time-bound case management program where we help specific individuals over a specific period of time to reach specific milestones. Um, and we're doing this all across the continent, including in Zambia and Rwanda. We also manage the Julia Taft Refugee Fund, which supports one-time low-cost interventions that address important gaps in uh, protection assistance for refugees and stateless persons annually. The fund, uh, which uh, started in 2000, supports national or local NGOs to help refugees and returnees across the continent. And in selecting proposals, we make it a point to pay special attention to those that benefit refugee women. Um, let me give you one very quick example. For example, in Cameroon, uh, we support an association called Association of Young Volunteers of Ngondere, and they constructed two modern wells and established a forming, um, farming cooperative around the wells for out-of-camp uh, um, Central African re refugees um, from two villages in the north um, region. They taught the women market gardening techniques, uh, they taught them bookkeeping, basic accounting, and pre- and post-harvest management. Due to the advocacy with traditional rulers, the women were, um, they were able to gr uh, gain access to land in a context where the right to land was often not given for, um, to women. The beneficiaries reported significant increases in incomes, increased feeding of their children, improved hygiene due to the availability of clean water, and to their increased incomes. And this is just one example of many that we support across the continent of Africa every year. The awards themselves are small, but they do have a lasting impact. And I myself have had an opportunity to meet with many of the beneficiaries. Um, we also work, for example, um, to support women uh, to increase the capacity of women-led organizations to meaningfully participate in initiatives to address local and national conflicts. And this is spearheaded, for example, one, uh, one example is the Secretary's Office of Global Women's Issues is working with uh, Search for Common Ground in the Democratic Republic of Congo, the Central African Republic, and Cameroon to support grassroots peace-building efforts and to create a more uh, conducive environment for women's effective participation and to encourage men and boys mm -hmm. to recognize and address gender inequalities. And that's very, very important. Let me just conclude also with what's new. So the United States made three pledges to advance self refugee self-reliance at the December 2021 UNHCR High Levels Official Meeting. We pledged to join the Refugee Self-Reliance Initiative to reach 250,000 refugees with self-reliance programming in at least five countries. We also pledged to continue supporting multilateral development bank financing for refugees and host communities with the aim to enhance refugee self-reliance and to support 10 existing pledges to advance refugee inclusion and self-reliance. Uh, PRM and the Secretary's Global Women's Issues have also had discussions, including earlier this year, with refugee groups and refugee women representatives to help us determine how we can make multilateral f uh, platforms, such as the Commission on the Status of Women, uh, more accessible to civil society, including refugee women. 
uh, we really recognize the importance of facilitating an involvement of women, including refuge, refugee women, in decision making that impacts their lives. And we're looking at how to best to follow up. Um, in conclusion, just three best practices. They're general, but I think that they're, um, it's always good to uh, keep them in mind. And I would say that we need to engage with refugee women operating at all levels mm -hmm. and focusing intentionally on the follow-up. It's always the follow-up. And again, as Megan noted, we cannot allow them to be treated as tokens. We need to provide capacity building and mentorship for refugee women involved in a range of peace building activities. And they need to be sustainable, not just one-offs. And then we need to create tangible opportunities for refugee women to be at the table and to truly own the space. Uh, but there, again, there's a lot that has been done, but there's so much more left to be done. With that, I'll stop right here. Thanks. Thank you very much, Van Allen. I think there's uh, a lot of questions that you uh, have raised in, in your intervention as well. Uh, we're already getting uh, quite some questions from uh, our uh, virtual audience, and I want to add a few of my own. Um, Megan, one of the things I think you have uh, stressed and that is also being uh, asked in some of the questions is that it's really important that we break down these policy silos. Mm -hmm. And I think, uh, Vernal, you, you also uh, mentioned that. and. Uh, because a lot of the initiative that you have been talking about focus sort of on the social economic mm -hmm. side, but of course the, the problem, these peace negotiations are really at the political level. And how do we get refugee women to the political level? Um, and then I think more specifically for Sandra afterwards would be a question about, uh, you talked about the network advocacy of uh, women refugees. And I think it might be interesting to distinguish between the women refugees in settlements, uh, the women's groups in the country of origin. Uh, should they also include women's groups in the host country? How does that work currently? And are there actually any examples of um, you know, successes where women have been involved in um, the shaping and the monitoring of, of peace negotiations. But let me first start maybe with, with Me Megan, you know, more, more generally. Yeah, um, thanks for that and, and for folks posing those questions at home. Um, because WPS operates in such a silo, it's sort of left on the side, it doesn't get the resources, you know, I'm gonna use the US ex as an example. We have great prevention-oriented canon of law. We have the Global Fragility Act. We're very excited at AFP in particular, and Mercy Corps, we co-chair the GFA Coalition, um, to see the recent release of the priority co countries in context. Um, we have the Eli Wiesel Atrocity uh, Prevention Act, and we have you know all of our broad foreign assistance, development, humanitarian. We need to be integrating WPS into every facet of those. Um, it needs, WPS cannot, be just this little thing over on the side that we're, again, I keep talking about box ticking exercises. Uh, it's the law. It's the law. It is required. Um, a big flaw with the WPS Act was that it didn't provide a separate WPS fund or specific amounts mm -hmm. of funding. Um, so that is a challenge. That's something we need to keep advocating for, that there need to be resources. And Congress has done better in the last few years. Um, they have provided more funding, but it's very discretionary. It's a, it's a, you sh maybe should think about doing this. It's not a shall. Uh, so that's a big problem in terms of implementation. And so they're really enshrining WPS into humanitarian pr principles. I mean, we've been talking about SGBV quite a bit. That's a big uh, you know, priority of the humanitarian community. How do we work together and, and to be speaking the same language? Uh, as I mentioned, cl uh, climate and conflict, it's just getting worse. Um, and so how do we ensure that we're doing conflict-sensitive, and gender sensitive climate programming and vice versa. We need to, again, have this shared language where we're all speaking in one voice and, and sort of you know, singing from the same choir sheet because, again, that everybody's sort of operating in these different spaces and doing good work, but how do we do it better? And by working together and breaking down these silos, we can be more effective. So do you think like a feminist foreign policy would enable to get better integration of 
uh, a you know integrating a gender perspective in all of your policies that would be the hope <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean i think that's you're seeing really good models rolled out around the around the world you know s a little slow but we're we're getting there and you know there's a new one every year which is really exciting to see and they are centering gender equality and equity um, and not just women's rights, gender equity. And so that's a really important distinction as well. We need to start talking about gender, peace, and security, not just WPS. Um, and then when that's integrated, they have better policies. They have better outcomes. We have more sustainable peace agreements. We know that when women are involved in peace processes, they're more inclusive, they're more durable. Um, and so when we have that data, why aren't we moving forward to, to make it the norm and not the exception? It's time. Vernel, I see you nodding. Well, no, I think it, that uh, you know, at, this, at the core of what we do, um, particularly in my bureau, Bureau of Population, Refugees and Migration, but also across the US agency, um, you, the interagency, we really focus a lot on the role of women and how uh, women are impacted by what we do. Um, and I, so I think it's very important to just underscore that, again, by, I focus a lot in my remarks by looking at what we do as humanitarians in supporting women and by taking some burdens off of their backs so that they're be better able to take on leadership roles. Again, women do quite a lot, but the point is it tends to be informal. It tends to be behind the scenes. And how do we lift women up? to make sure that their voices are heard. And we, you know, throughout our programming, um, we do so at many different levels. So again, it could be through camp management, supporting women and saying that, you know, women need to be involved in food distribution points. Uh, because again, we know that this is one avenue for possible abuse of women and girls. And so by ensuring that women are involved in decision-making processes in how camps are run, for example, that's one way to show that women have ideas, these ideas should be listened to, and not just listened to, but they should also be implemented. Um, we support, again, uh, we're the largest donor to UNHCR around the world and also in Africa. We, again, a lot of what UH, UNHCR does, again, is to support women, not just from the humanitarian perspective, but also they do support uh, women being able to raise their voices and to also engage in peace building at many different levels. And so again, we're very proud of our um, support for UNHCR and other international partners, also NGOs, they're also very important. Um, and to say that, uh, you know, that it's really important to make sure that we have and we support and we lift women up. Let me just note that one example of what we do and what we expect of our partners, uh, we have a principle which is called accountability to affected populations. Essentially, we ask each and every time when we put out requests for proposals and things, we say, um, how will the beneficiaries, including refugee women, be involved in the design of, in the monitoring of, in the implementation of, evaluation of these various projects? And so we have to see when we have a proposal, um, you know, how women will be, their voices will be heard. And again, it may, it's, it's something that we do constantly, something that we do with basically all of our programming. And again, it just shows that, uh, again, we're committed to ensuring that we listen to women. Um, finally, I just want to note that I think it's very important that, uh, that we ensure that we not just listen to women, but also look for tangible milestones, tan make tangible goals, um, and rather than just say, we'll do leadership um, for leadership's sake, but it really has to be tied to um, investment in women. Um, so I think it's really, really important that, um, uh, particularly from where I sit, and I must say that we do have in PRM a gender um, bureau, a, a gender team that looks at all of our strategies and they go through each and every page and they make sure that we did in fact take into account women and refugee women in what we're doing, wherever we're doing it on the continent of Africa. Now this is just an example within our bureau, but this is applied, I must say, um, in our approach to our partners. Um, and so I'm very proud of what we're doing, again, to lift the voices of women. Thanks. Thanks, yeah, I think, uh, you know, what you're mentioning, it's, it's really very important to have that sort of meaningful and intentional evaluation and monitoring of the programs that you develop and I think it's very important that you ask of your subcontractors, et cetera, to do that Absolutely. as well. Can I so give a quick two things yes. on that? Yes. Mm -hmm. I think that's really important, the, the metrics component. Um, and it's definitely gotten better, <coughs> but one of the challenges is a lot of them, we find WPS tends to get double counted. 
um, in terms of both indicators and outputs, as well as with funds expended. So we need to sort of break down the silos between the gender issues uh, to make sure that we are giving adequate money to SDBG specifically, to economic empowerment, to WPS, because this double counting is making it very difficult to track how WPS is being implemented in the United States. And just the point on the integration strategies, really critical point. We need WPS, gender equity, to be in the national security strategy, um, the counterterrorism strategy, the uh, USAID local capacity development draft that's in, you know, we saw that there a bit, which is, is a really good sign. Obviously, we have the USAID gender policy, so we need all those good elements there to be integrated across sectors, um, you know, the climate policy, et cetera. So just making sure that women, refugee women specifically, and local women are included across the board. Right. And so Sandra, let's go to you. Okay. Yes. And if I can just quickly add to this conversation. Why don't you quickly add to the conversation um, and then, <laughs> and then I'll go to the question for okay. you. Um, so one of the findings also of the research was that yes, indeed, there is support to refugee women's leadership in peace building in, the, in their settlements, so to peaceful coexistence and to the, the challenges that they face where they are, but that there's not as much support for them to, to take on similar peace building roles in their countries of origin. Mm -hmm. So there's no support, for example, for them to access information about what's going on in their countries, to be able to support for them to contribute to what's being discussed or to, you know, to extend that capacity and those roles to essentially what's going on there. So I think that's also an area that you know, would um, benefit from ad attend ad added support you know, and attention. And so would that be basically you know, outside actors saying or making that sort of a condition for further assistance? Or including them, including it in, in ongoing efforts. So if they're being supported to, I don't know, participate to, to, to organize activities that build peace at community level, that incorporating into those activities elements that link back to the country. So maybe that same activity includes uh, an element that, that it maybe another actor, an external actor, or somebody in South, in, in the case of my research would be South Sudan, is, is part of those activities and provides information and receives their views, um, documents their voices, and takes it back to you know discussions in country, so that it's built into existing work and it's not seen as a separate um, sort of you know separate component track. exactly mm -hmm. something for somebody else. And also also another um, observation was that the support is very um, sort of compartmentalized like. We work in Uganda, and therefore we can only support them in Uganda. We work in South Sudan, we can support them in South Sudan, mm -hmm. but not really making those connections um, and having a, a more sort of transnational or sort of regional approach. Yes, yeah, so that's also a bureaucratic barrier. Exactly, is, uh, yeah, it's uh, indeed a bureaucratic barrier. Now, t tell me, since uh, you've done extensive research, how, how does this work currently? Uh, there are a lot of uh, South Sudanese refugees in Uganda, um, to what extent have the women organized themselves in these refugee uh, settlements or refugee camps or in the country more generally? Um, and what type of information are they getting or what kind of connections do they have with women's group that, have, uh, that are in South Sudan? So how does this okay. work currently? Okay, so currently, um, so refugee women are organized into loose networks for different purposes, but for peace building, um, they're organized into what, what, what are called mediation networks. So they work together to address conflict cases I within their community, within families, um, and in certain cases, they gather early, as I mentioned earlier, they gather early warning information, they track specific indicators and gather early warning information which they then share with um, you know, local leaders, local peace co district peace, peace committees for further action. Um, they also track um, specific information about, for example, in relation to resources, you talked about the issue of climate change and, and how that's impacting you know, peace. And so they also they, they track issues like um, conflict associated with resources, the trends to see what needs to be done. Um, and they do all of that in networks. So depending on where you are, you're gathering different information. They come together, they analyze that information, and they decide on what needs to be done. Can we deal with it um, you know, as mediators, or does it need to go to the you know, district peace committees or to the camp leaders for action? Um, and in relation to the networked advocacy, um, so the, the, um, the refugee women in their networks work with local leaders, and they work with um, local, so as refugee women and Ugandan women 
leaders. So they work with women in the hosting communities as well. So they do this work together. So in that sense, they are working outside of the settlement, but they're working on common peace, peace building issues. Um, they also work with women's rights organizations. So for example, Women's International Peace Center, you know, the organization where I work, works with refugee women peace builders. And it's through those kinds of partnerships that they're able to then um, you know, be connected to discussions in South Sudan. So for example, Women's International Peace Center also works in South Sudan and is able to bring, to make that connection, to keep them abreast of what's going on, what's the implementation progress, what's happening now, what's going to happen you know, in the future that you can prepare for, what are your thoughts on this and making that connection. In the past, um, you know, after conducting research, so for example, we conducted a research on um, the gender, the extent to which gender has been um, incorporated in the implementation of, the, in the early implementation of the agreement. So to disseminate the findings of that research to them, to tell them this is what we have found, this is what we are recommending, um, and also to get you know, their feedback, to bring them, to organize um, sort of meetings that bring them together with other women in South Sudan who are pushing for gender responsive implementation of the peace agreement, who are just pushing for pro promotion of the WPS agenda in general. So to bring them together to discuss the same issues, to make sure that what the refugee women think um, is being heard by women who are active in the country so that their views and their priorities are integrated into the discussions and the advocacy in the country. Um, but one of the challenges is being able to sustain that um, because, as for example, at the moment, so much is going on. Um, uh, a permanent constitution is, is going to be made. There's discussions around transitional justice. You mentioned transitional justice. Um, elections are going to be coming up. So there are various processes, um, and there would be a need for more sustained connection with those actors who are engaged in those processes, but also sustained support for them to be able to get that kind of information. So for example, at the time that I was conducting my interviews, um, the refugee women did not know that a permanent constitution was being made. Um, they didn't know uh, that there was a draft bill. They didn't know that they had made a provision for there to be one refugee representative. So they, you know, so to have that information on what is going on, what are the potential entry points for refugee women to have their voices heard or to be able to reach out to somebody who can ensure that their priorities are included, um, I think is, is what's still needed. So it's, it's, it's to an extent, it's a successful strategy, but I would not say that it has been successfully implemented um, and broadly implemented. Also in relation to the earlier discussion that the focus is more on peaceful coexistence, the, the focus of the work of actors in the country is focused on peaceful ex coexistence in the country. So there would still be need for more you know, support that links to their country's and efforts. So what is the biggest barrier there? Is that uh, basically funding for yes. uh, non-governmental civil society actors? Because I imagine that this kind of work, you know, bringing women together, uh, disseminating the information, uh, is going to be most effective when it's civil society organizations who do that, right? You don't want government, I guess. Mm. <laughs> so is, is the biggest barrier, is that funding uh, and sort of sustained funding for civil society organizations? Yes, I would say that funding is a big barrier. Um, and also, <coughs> I think she mentioned that there are several pressing challenges so that even actors that, that are working within that context are tend to prioritize other more sort of pressing needs, but indeed funding is one of the, the major barriers. And the like short-term the short -term funding, right? You know, exactly. these organizations are getting a one-year grant, maybe exactly. two if they're lucky, and then they have to go through the really burdensome process of applying again, and so how do we figure out long-term long flexible exactly. procurement mechanisms mm -hmm. to help them? What about, we haven't really talked about the role of the African Union and particularly regional economic communities. Would they have a role in, I mean, these multilateral co organizations could also play a role in helping to establish such uh, networks and information sharing. Is anything happening on that, s on that side? Sandra, yes, for I now? Can well, I, what do you want to go? Please, I'll let you start. Okay, um, so I know of the work of the Office of the Spe Special Envoy on Women, Peace, and Security um, uh, within the African Union. Um, uh, where they've, they've played a key role in making sure that refugee women's voices are included. Um, so they've hosted different um, like forums. So we had last year a, a big WPS forum that included specifically refugee women. 
um, and, and what their priorities are, what their needs are from, from governments and from you know, regional actors. Um, the special envoy um, herself has done consultation, so for example, in Uganda with refugee women and has also been to South Sudan. So we have those kinds of processes that are going on um, and has also supported their efforts to, to be included in regional conversations around peace and security, around silencing the guns. Um, so there is progress indeed um, and, and there, there are actions from regional actors. Then? Yes, I'll agree with Sandra. I mean, there's definitely interest and there are definitely lots of activities. I do track the activities of the special envoy as well. Um, and so uh, there is, again, engagement. But again, for all of us, all of us, uh, you know, there, there's so much more work to be done and, and we just simply have to do more. And I think that we have to be able to coordinate and collaborate even more um, intentionally on these, um, on these issues. Again, um, you know, what we see is we do have conversations, we do have discussions, we do meet with refugee women, um, again, at the very highest levels, um, and so there is that kind of support. But as uh, Sandra rightly noted, that um, one of the key issues is making sure that refugee women and others as well are informed of mm. what's going back in their home countries. Mm. Again, uh, um, again, we have issues of you know, funding to get them back to their home countries, issue of um, just uh, uh, knowledge of what's going on, and there's just not enough of that. Um, and so while, yes, uh, we have seen activities, for example, by UNHCR to uh, facilitate discussions um, in various countries about what's going back, um, what's happening in their home countries, uh, again, it needs to be, but from all of us, much more sustained. Mm. Um, and again, it's great to have conversations, but as I mentioned earlier, what's the follow-up? What's the plan? Uh, what's the next step? What's the next five steps, the next 10 steps? And so uh, we all have to be even more intentional about that. Um, and again, it's a, it's a matter of sustained investment um, in keeping women uh, informed of the situation in their home countries and encouraging actors to have, to ensure that they eke out a space dedicated to the voices of refugees and especially refugee women because they do have a very specific um, experience that's unique, that's much more difficult. And so again, their voices need to be heard. So again, yes, it's been done. Has it been done enough? Has it been done in a sustainable way? Uh, again, there's much work on, um, left on that score. Um. We haven't really talked so much about the sort of structural barriers, and that is, you know, not just the cultural norms, but the patriarchal systems uh, that are, uh, you know, very strong, uh, both in the African context, but I would say across the world. Uh, and uh, Megan, you, you mentioned earlier Afghanistan. Uh, that is, of course, also a huge issue there. So what can we do to overcome that barrier? And let me start with you, uh, Megan, and maybe you want to bring in that example of Afghanistan. Yeah, uh, thanks for that. Um, a lot of work needs <laughs> to be done and <laughs> where to start. Um, you know, there's good work being done uh, surrounding you know, peaceful masculinities. And so how do we invest and scale some of this work where we're going into to local contexts, um, you know, sort of bringing in, creating male allies, and that's why it's important. So um, I know there was work in Afghanistan in particular where they would go to the imams, the, the tribal leaders throughout the country, meet with them, point to Sharia, point to the law, and say, this is where it says, you know, women should be respected, women should get educated. And so kind of did that just, tr you know, building trust and, and buy-in, and all of a sudden, you know, then women were and girls were allowed to go to school or allowed to work outside the home and things like that. And so doing that work on the community level is absolutely vital. And it, it, it succeeded in a large, like these programs that were around Afghanistan changed lives. You know, that was the big thing and over the, the 20 years in Afghanistan. The, the big win was the gains and strides that, that women and girls made. We were very concerned with the withdrawal, what was going to happen, and we're seeing it play out in real time. That many of those gains have been dramatically curtailed, um, if not completely eviscerated. So in terms of the, the structural process you know, there, for instance, you had men talking to men at the highest levels. You had the United States talking to the Taliban. Even the government was mostly uh, sidelined there. 
when women were involved, particularly in the Moscow talks, you had four women, which, you know, great. We're glad to see that they were represented, but they were, you know, sort of political. They weren't, they didn't represent civil society. They didn't represent, a, you know, different uh, ethnicities, geographies. So that's really problematic. You know, I spoke earlier. Women are not a monolith, so you need to be ensuring that women's representation reflects that at, at the formal processes. And so we need investors, again, to make it women's inclusion, refugee women's inclusion, an absolute priority. It can't just be talking one-on-one -on -one with the, the men that engaged in the war. You need to be bringing in those who are impacted, and again, women are disproportionately impacted, especially refugee women. So it's, it's a heavy lift. It requires a radical rethinking of the way we go about diplomacy, of the way we go about negotiation. But again, we have the tools in place. We have the mechanisms in place. We need gender advisors on every delegation. Really excited about the new uh, negotiation support unit in the State Department. They have this little concentration of expertise, bringing all these considerations of women, of refugees, uh, of different um, eth you know, ethnicities and abilities, et cetera. They can be a vital resource. They need to be involved, and gender advisors need to be involved in every negotiation and formal process that moves forward. And, and you did see gender advisors almost entirely excluded um, from the process um, between Khalzad and the Taliban. So again, radical change. What about uh, in, in the specific case in uh, Uganda and South Sudan? So I would say that um, I think somebody mentioned about the work on, on positive masculinity. So I think at community level that there's need for that kind of work that um, because men play a big role in being able to to either limit or promote you know women's participation at that level. So so incorporating into activities that target refugee populations and host community populations, elements that promote um, you know that kind of peaceful masculinity, but also targeting um, public institutions. So, because it's at that level that decisions are made to specifically exclude or that or to exclude women, refugee women, or to exclude their perspectives, or that it's at that level that the perspectives of or the capacities of refugee women are undermined. Um, um, so I think that there would also be need for work that focuses on, um, you know, decision-making structures and on and maybe legal measures and exactly uh, introduction of quotas. Mm -hmm. Well, also in the implement, so in the case of South Sudan, for instance, um, there's a 35% quota for women's representation that's not being fulfilled. Um, so we see that even when there are quotas, that it takes a bit more um, for them to be fully implemented. And some of it is because of, you know, these conceptual um, sort of like barriers and the need for, I guess, further accountability, which I guess, which is also um, a role that other actors can play in providing that practical support and, and encouraging these actors and also maybe holding them accountable to make sure that they indeed implement you know, the quotas that they've put in place and, and they translate their commitment to being inclusive and peace building into action. Bernard, do you want to add something on the, oh, the patriarchy? <laughs> <laughs> the patriarchy <laughs> in the US or <laughs> elsewhere? <laughs> well, it's a tough issue and it affects uh, women and girls uh, in many parts of the world, including in Africa. And as someone who's lived in Africa for a number of years, um, I know myself, even in my official role sometimes, you know, people say, look to the male colleague and say, you must be in charge. And you're like, no, it's me, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so imagine refugee women. Mm. Imagine how high of a mountain they have to climb uh, to make sure that their voices are heard. Um, listen, I think it's, you know, grassroots, um, you know, working on the, at the grassroots level, trying to change minds and thoughts. Of, and I must say, you know, it's working on men and boys, but it's also working on women as well. Because when, you know, women grew up in these uh, societies where you have very um, patriarchal systems, even the women sometimes, they take on and say they think that they can't. And, and, you know, and so we have to encourage and say, yes, you can. You have the skills. And making sure that they have, so again, it's, it's working on men and boys, but also women in terms of addressing um, mindsets, uh, looking at gender inequalities, um, and then number one, and then number two is again providing support um, and identifying champions, mm. champions particularly in the political structures. There's nothing like having a very strong woman in politics to say this must change, we must do better, we must speak up, and also to have the men 
in political structures do the same and follow it up with concrete action. Again, there's uh, you, you, one can say a lot, but then it all comes down to the devil, you know, the devil's in the details. Where is the action? Again, lots of laws and quotas and different things, but then they're rarely implemented. And so it's a matter of saying, um, you know, looking and investing in champions who can raise these issues to the fore. Um, and again, it's a generational um, challenge. It's not something that we can fix anytime soon, but I think little by little, step by step, we have to continue chipping away and at different levels, grassroots, at the national levels, at the local levels, uh, regional levels. It's um, a lot of times we focus on nationals, you know, and the capital-based activities, but it's also very important to identify those champions that are outside of the capitals and look for those and to see how we can support them. And again, networking. It's really import important to support the networks of refugee women who um, call attention to the issues of inequality. Um, and again, it's, it's a matter of making sure that they have the cap capacity, they have the training, but also they have a seat at the tables where the discussions are being uh, taking place at the very highest levels. And again, this is an area that we're very much involved in at the moment. So I'm really excited to see where it's gonna go. Um, but we're very much looking at how do we get the refugee women at the table? Um, and also keep in mind, it's not just a matter of getting them at the table. There's the months of the buildup to whatever event you, uh, we are preparing for, and then it's to follow through to ensure that their thoughts are in the actual agreements that are reached and that there's implementation. So there's a whole life cycle of investment that's needed in refugee women. Yeah, so um, I think actually related to this issue is the uh, horrific amount of sexual violence against women and girls in particular. Uh, and I think it is against women and girls, ordinary women and girls, uh, but particularly also the violence against uh, women who are active politically, mm. uh, women peace building builders. Um, are there any particular structures or initiatives that can be put into place to protect in particular also those um, women peace builders, those women who are politically active. Uh, what can we do uh, to uh, protect them, and of course, women in general? Um, and then uh, second, and that is maybe not quite related, but uh, there's a question here, uh, whether there is a role for the private sector in helping refugee women um, getting a seat at the table and um, you know, getting their, their voices heard. So the uh, sexual violence in general and then sexual violence uh, and the violence uh, against women peace builders, maybe Megan, you want to start us off because this is an issue that we see everywhere and not just in Africa but also in Europe there was a report of the um, European Parliament, uh, that was just incredible, the amount of violence and online violence mm -hmm. uh, women politicians are subjected to. Yeah, I mean, it's a really difficult question. Um, I mean, I think identifying, calling it out as we're doing right now is absolutely critical um, because too often it's sort of an afterthought, it's not, it doesn't, you know, splash all over the headlines. Um, but we need protection mechanisms because we want to encourage women to participate in politics and all facets of society. So it's really important that we think through a strategy that we're going to protect them. So whether that's, um, you know, not to go back to Afghanistan again, but we had all kinds of safe houses set up all around the country when we knew things were going badly. And so trying to keep them safe, trying to move them around, shuttle them sort of in the dark of night to make sure that they were in a, in a safe space and, and it often required a lot of shuffling because then all of a sudden the Taliban would find out where they were and then, you know, and you're seeing forced disappearances and, it, you know, this is not unique to Afghanistan, it happens all over the world um, in conflict-affected contexts. So identifying it, working with local networks, I mean, this is a theme here, right? We need to be on the ground, local voices, those that have the information, have the intel of what's going on, supporting them in logistics and obviously funding, transportation, um, to the extent they need to, uh, you know, evacuate the country, making it easier. And so, you know, we've seen 
in previous conflicts where there are a lack of immigration barriers, and so do we create a, you know, a humanitarian parole category specifically for women persecuted, uh, in women human right defenders and, and political folks? I think there's a really strong argument for that um, based on you know, recent experiences. Um, and then we need monitoring. Uh, it's really critical that we have, in all, e even in active conflicts and, and post-conflict contexts, that we have monitoring missions on the ground that can identify um, you know, independent neutral actors that can identify human rights abuses, persecution of women, human rights defenders. Um, so again, there's lots of roles there to play with UN, AU, uh, AU different multilateral and, and, and bilateral partners. Um, so that's something that needs to be not only implemented to address the immediate danger to which women are subject, but the long-term accountability and justice mechanisms as well. Sandra? Um, yes, so you addressed a lot of the things that I was going to highlight, but I will add another thing that um, fo that is a focus for us is, is also um, engaging with the women peace builders in advance. Um, so before a heightened risk um, exists, so training on, on you know security, so physical security, digital security, um, well-being, um, preparing them for you know what's likely to come, um, providing safe spaces also just to discuss the strategies, what happens when, how can you avoid avoid this. I'm linking them with um, women human rights defenders networks in the country, so that you know you know that in the event of this, I can contact this actor. Um, so indeed, yeah, networking, preparing in advance, creating safe spaces. Yeah, essentially, I think those would be, and also doing the long-term work. Um, in a doing the long-term work to to challenge the mindsets and the attitudes and the practices that lead to this being normalized and perpetuated. Um, and just like highlighting the need for sort of for accountability for these kinds of actions mm -hmm. and linking them to actors that provide emergency response to you know human rights defenders when they are at risk or when they're under attack. Do you want to add something from that? I think uh, Megan and Sa uh, Sandra covered a lot of the space, but I just want to add that I think it's very important. Again, when we hear about cases of women being um, threatened, it's very important to say, we hear you. Mm. We know um, we know that you're under threat to them, but also to others, and say we know that these individuals are under threat, and it's your job to protect them. Mm -hmm. That alone carries a lot of weight, um, because it's very important to s you know when uh, different actors band together and say we're concerned. Uh, we have lots of power in our um, in our numbers. And so it's very important to, again, s uh, uh, speaking out, I can't underscore, underscore that enough, um, but also to um, you know, ensure that these issues are discussed again in advance. Um, you can't wait till there's a crisis to say, oh, uh, let me see what I can do. <laughs> that you have to engage in active crisis management at all times and to, to think ahead, you know, five, 10 steps ahead, what happens if this person's threatened because of all the great work that she is doing mm -hmm. to assist herself and her community and women um, across, um, you know, maybe in the country or even internationally. Um, so again, I think it's important that um, that y we also have to understand and, and listen to the, the women in particular. What would make them most comfortable? Um, again, they take risks that all of us sitting here may have never taken before in our lives. And so we have to put ourselves in, our, in their shoes and say, how can we best help you? It's not a good idea to say, oh, I have an idea. I think I know what to do. And, and then it may not work for that particular person. So it's really important to listen and hear and get from their perspective what would make them feel most comfortable. But again, as I said, um, you know, we in the U.S. government, but particularly my bureau, the Bureau of Population, Refugees, and Migration, we focus on protecting women and girls writ large throughout what we do. It could be, as we mentioned before, gender-based violence. Uh, again, we're very engaged in that. We always track, you know, are there increases of gender-based violence in any part, a pocket of Africa, and we're on it. I can assure you that we talk about it. We engage and we ask, what are we doing? What are um, what are our partners doing? To, to address that specific issue in that specific camp, in that specific country. And we really get down into the very nitty gritty details. But also, you know, it's the economic, you know, safeguarding uh, women economically. 
um, and ensuring that they have the resources, the wherewithal, so that they don't become victims of sexual violence and physical violence because of the fact that they don't have the income and they may engage in negative coping mechanisms. Right. And so for me, I interpret the issue of safety very broadly that we have to look at safety and security in all aspects, political, economic, um, you know, social, in all, all aspects. Just one quick yeah. point mm -hmm. on that. I think there's a, a big role for the international community to play when we see women human rights defenders and peace builders under attack leverage with finances. Mm -hmm. Say, we're gonna tie this aid, you want humanitarian assistance, you want development assistance, well, you, you can't have that until you release everybody from prison or find all those disappeared women. Um, so there's an opportunity there to leverage uh, you know, financial assistance to these states. Or punish. Uh, <laughs> or no. sanctions or, you know, or different you know, course of mechanisms. So. Now, uh, a role for private sector? And what role would that be and which private sector should we be thinking of? Uh, you know, I can think of uh, philan philanthropic mm -hmm. uh, organizations and foundations. Well, it is clear that civil society needs way more support and support that is on the long term, not just short programmatic support, but support that they know is there for the long term so that they can set up these networks and these information networks. Um, I have three words, corporate social responsibility. <laughs> Yes. Uh, you know, we have to say, you know, what are you doing in this country, in this region? Um, you know, we talk a lot about um, the need for the private sector to encourage, uh, for example, good environmental practices or good human rights practices, good labor practices, and, you know, to encourage, you know, say, if you have an investment in this country, what are you doing to promote the rights of the people of that country, including women and girls? And, in, oh, by the way, if you have refugee women as well, you know, there's a whole business now about sustainable development, and there's an, a whole um, interest in, you know, um, uh, locally sustained or, or sourced goods, um, free trade, if you will, and fair trade. And so I think that we can... Uh, do more to encourage the private sector to support refugee women, for example, in their, um, yes, it may be small, and yes, they may need extra assistance in terms of the quality, and for markets, big, m they may need niche markets, and because they, you know, they need to be able to um, be able to produce the goods at a certain time, but also keep in mind that, and this is, uh, this points to a larger issue, I think, of the need for relief to development coherence and the continued focus in that area. That is to say that we want to encourage and continue to encourage development actors to look at how to include refugee women in uh, um, their development to a specific country. Um, and that's why we are very much supportive of, for example, the IDA uh, windows to uh, host communities and refugees, where we look at what, um, you know, what governments can get from the World Bank to um, provide to their, community, um, to their communities. And this goes to not just refugees, but also host communities. It's very important to ensure that we have social cohesion between the host communities and the refugees. Again, you don't want a situation in which refugees get assistance, and then what about the people around where they live? Um, and they say, well, you know, we are also suffering too. And so I think it's really important that we want to continue to encourage, but it's not, it's one thing to get, a, you know, a grant, but it's another to implement the grant. And, and, and to move on the grant. So uh, again, private sector has a role to play. I think development actors have a role to play. And again, it's really important as we're talking about development writ large, we look at how are we getting refugees from you know, humanitarian assistance more towards integration, more towards sustainable integration, um, a sustainable livelihood. Um, and again, that's a really, really important area um, that we, have to, we can't forget. Yeah, I think your point of corporate social responsibility is 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 a very good point, and uh, that also puts then you know responsibility on us. We, us who are sitting here in Washington D.C., all these multinational uh, corporations have a responsibility in the countries in which they operate. So I think that's a point well taken, and I think we should take this up, uh, you know, <laughs> everywhere where. Um, where we are. And Chantal, I think yeah. there's a, it's a really important point. How do we link peace building in, in the private sector? And I think there is sort of an emerging conversation happening right now, which is exciting. 
they need to be supporting peace building because we make the space safe for them to go in and invest yeah. and yeah. make it, you know, yeah. we're going to help you make money. So you should support peace building to get, you know, to create the situation um, for when they can go on the ground. And um, just sort of building on, on, on what you said, there's an opportunity to be investing in women in refugee uh, camps, giving them, you know, micro loans or, you know, coming up with dynamic programs that they can implement and make money and, and procure that little economic safety that they, they, you know, they're seeking in those contexts. So there's definitely a role, I think. Okay, I think we're coming to the end. I don't know if there are any questions here in the audience. Um, one last question from our virtual audience, and that is when we're talking about women and women peace building, we often talk about grassroots movements and um, the informal networks that are important of women, et cetera. But how can we scale up that grassroots, that informal network to a more formal network? Because if you want to have a say at that peace negotiating table, your informal grassroots network is not really going to help. You need to formalize this. So are there ways in which you can sort of formalize and move from the informal networks to the formal networks? And, you know, are there any um, examples actually of where that was done well? Uh, and I'm thinking maybe Colombia um, is, is a good example. <clears throat> and then I want to also ask you to leave us with, you know, what's the final thought? What do you want to uh, have our audience take away from, from this session? Or, you know, what's their, their homework you want to give to them? <laughs> uh, so I'll start with Vernel, Sandra, and then Megan. Great. Um, so I think uh, I'll leave the, uh, my lasting thought <laughs> first. Um, but uh, I don't know, to sum up, I would say, um, I, you know, in my office, there is a saying on my wall. And each and every day when I go to my office, or at least three times a, a week, it says a refugee would like to have your problems. Hmm. And that keeps me grounded. And I come into work saying, how can I, how can the team, how can we all do better? There's someone suffering today. And, and so I think it's really important to say that, you know, uh, we have to look at refugees as, as, positive, um, as, as people who can pr uh, do so much for their communities. I think, you know, I think of famous refugees like Albert Einstein, for example, but there are many, many, many others. And so we have to continue to look at refugees as not just victims or beneficiaries, as I mentioned earlier, but also as individuals who have something to bring to the table. As many of them have suffered so much. There must be some good from that suffering. How can we give them that voice? How can we give them that perch? How can we encourage them not only to address the needs, that, I mean, their very basic needs, but how also how can we lift them up so that the rest of the world can learn from these collective experiences? Um, so I think that, you know, the, the, for us, um, the, the big task at hand, as I said, is to invest in networks invest in, as I said, um, you know, not just one-offs or, you know, for the here and now, but look at the lifespan. How can, you know, you take a, a struggling network to, uh, you know, hanging in their network, getting their act together network to a, wow, this network has taken off. How can we take them to a higher level? And again, it's really important to look at all the different steps of the way. And if anything else, if I leave nothing else, perhaps I'll leave that with you. Thank you. I like your... Uh you're saying, uh, I would like to have your problem. Mm. <laughs> Sandra. Um, so on the first question, I, I think, in fact, we do have um, formal networks. Um, and that those formal networks tend to work with the grassroots networks. And it's um, sort of a l larger collaboration. So civil society in organizations that are structured, that receive um, you know, large funding, that have access to these spaces and this information, typically work with, you know, grassroots networks of women. So 
I don't know, women's groups, informal networks. So for example, in the case of, of Uganda, that was uh, a model around the, the Juba Peace Agreement in ensuring that the, the post-conflict reconstruction and development plan was you know, gender responsive and included women's voices. In the case of South Sudan, I would say as well that they organize you know, through a, a coalition, which I would say is a bit of a formal um, network. So I wouldn't say necessarily that, that there are no formal networks and that is why women are excluded from the table. The formal networks indeed um, exist and they benefit from the value and the constituencies um, that the grassroots networks um, you know, represent. So I would say indeed that there should be even more support to grassroots networks for them to be better perceived as critical actors who have a right to be at the table, whether or not that they are formal structures. And as well to the formal networks or the more formal networks so that they're able to make those linkages and make sure that the grassroots actors are also included, are at the table and are seen and heard. And that links to my final message. So mine would be that, you know, that we should acknowledge that, you know, refugee women are skilled peace builders. They may have gone through horrible experiences, but they've been able to demonstrate their leadership um, uh, in the communities where they exist as strong peace builders and that we should prioritize um, support for their peace building and invest in it. So invest in amplifying their agency and their voices in peace building within the countries that they are, but also in the countries of their origin. Thank you, yeah, Megan. I'll, I'll just echo everything she just said. And women are natural peace builders. Mm -hmm. They do it every day in their lives. We don't call it peace building, but that's what they do to mm -hmm. keep their families mm -hmm. together, to mm -hmm. keep their communities together. Mm -hmm. um, so why not invest in them when they already have the skills? Mm -hmm. And certainly the incentive, particularly women refugees, who just want to go home. They want to be mm -hmm. safe, they want to be secure, and they want to go home. Um, in terms of investing, what does that look like? It must be robust, mm -hmm. it must be flexible, it must be localized, mm -hmm. and it must be sustained. Uh, we need to also move forward in terms of integrating women's inclusion, women refugees specifically, into all aspects of peace building and peace processes. And we need to really start investing in conflict prevention and peace building upstream. We need to start intervening early so that we don't have more refugee women who are in these terrible situations. Let's, let's nip these conflicts in the bud. Let's start addressing them early and give women a chance to not become refugees. Or any ref or men too. No one wants to be a refugee. So how do we put the time, the the, inven the investment, excuse me, um, and really work to use all these great tools that we have, the GFA, the WPS Act, you know, all these all these um, vehicles that we can actually prevent conflict and prevent displacement in the first place. Um, and just one thing I always say, you know, if you give a woman an inch, she'll go a mile. So it's time to to give them the tools and resources to do that. Well, I want to thank you all for um, your insights. Uh, you are um, all deeply engaged in these issues. And uh, I also want to thank you for giving us some practical ways on how to move forward. Uh, to our audience, I would say uh, continue to follow the Southern Voices Network for Peace Building and the Africa program at the Wilson Center. There are way more uh, events like these that the Africa program is organizing and is initiatives it takes to uh, build up networks in Africa. So with that, thank you very much to our panelists and stay tuned. <laughs>